Hey folks, it's Dr. Gersmart, Aspire Natural Health. Sorry, a couple days late on getting this video out. Uh, we do have some Saturdays here at the clinic where we're trying to accommodate people um, that can't make doctor's visits on on a day-to-day -day, uh, schedule with on a day-to-day -day schedule with their schedules. Um, so while I had a few extra minutes, I thought I would definitely get in this video. So today we're talking about part two of how can I tell which foods are a problem for me, which is a really common question, right? Thanks to the internet, a lot of people now understand that what they eat can have a profound impact on their health and well-being. Although I have to tell you, it is still incredibly frustrating when we see that MDs and other professionals are telling people that what they eat has absolutely no impact on what's going on for someone. In fact, I, you know, just talking to someone recently, she was told categorically that food had no impact on what's going on and that it's just so absolutely incorrect. So, quick recap. Last last video, last week, we talked about the three primary ways that food can be a problem for someone. That is, the food can be toxic or poisonous. Two, the food can interact with the immune system, a person's immune system, to cause symptoms and trouble. Or three, the food can interact with the gut bacteria to cause issues for someone. So, Understanding now how that food can affect someone, let's talk about testing. So there are a variety of testing to different tests and testing that can help us to understand if certain foods are actually a problem and how they're a problem for people. Now I have to say in drafting up my outline of this talk, I quickly realized there is just a ton of stuff in this section. So today is going to be an overview, not an exhaustive account of different testing methods. All right, so first and foremost, let's talk about that third way, the gut bacteria and testing. Now we're just gonna briefly touch on this because fundamentally there are two different types of tests that you can look at here. There are going to be the different stool tests, that is poop tests, where through a variety of different ways that the poop or the stool can be analyzed and we can get a sense of bacteria and fungus, parasites and other things that might be going on in a person's digestive system. The second type of test here is going to be a SIBO test. Oh, okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate letting me know that not everybody can hear uh, what's going on so we can see about captioning. Thank you for the comment. Okay. The SIBO test. So SIBO tests, uh, you know, typically a breath test here, uh, looking at various overgrowths in the small intestine. Um, and we can go ahead and put in a link to the video we did on SIBO tests and the four things that you need to know to make sure that you're getting a SIBO test done properly. All right. So that's all we'll say right now. We'll have video in the future talking more in depth about stool tests because there's a lot that can be gone into there. But if we really think that there's a major issue going on with the gut bacteria, we can do things like stool tests and SIBO tests to give us a lot more data and actually know more specifically what's going on. Now, I did want to mention that if you approach your regular MD and ask for a stool test, you're not going to get these same type of stool tests we're talking about, um, unless your practitioner is very integrative, but we're just here talking about a normal MD, you're not going to get these same type of stool tests. Now, the two stool tests that MDs typically run are, are looking for two things. One, they're looking for blood in your stool, which can be a sign of a more serious digestive problem going on for someone. And the second is they're looking for parasites. So if you go in complaining of diarrhea or pain, or they think you, you might have picked up a parasite, that's what you're going to get typically when a regular MD says a stool test. So please, most of the time, don't go in thinking that you're going to get these kind of advanced stool testing uh, from an MD, the kind that insurance is typically going to pick up and pay for. All right, so having set that aside for a moment, where we're going to focus the rest of today's talk is, is on the immune system. Because that is most of the way, when we talk about food causing problems for people, excluding toxicity and poisonings, and then le <clears throat> leaving aside the impact on bacteria and things like SIBOs, most of the time what we're talking about is that the food interacts with the immune system to cause different symptoms and problems. And there are a variety of tests that can pick those up. So let's start with one. That's simple. Celiac disease, or at least... 
guess it's not simple. Uh, we just picked up two new cases of celiac disease in people that had not been diagnosed by other doctors and people have been suffering for, for quite a long time with that. So celiac disease is a blood test that can look for the presence of antibodies um, that are present when celiac disease happens. Uh, now, the second type, for example, um, are allergy tests, right? So these are tests that an allergy doctor, an allergist, or a conventional MD will run to see if you have an allergy to different foods. These are typically either a blood test that's done, or it can be either what's called a scratch test or um, a prick test. And typically these are done on the back, sometimes they are done on the forearms, on the inside of the arms, and these are injecting, <clears throat> excuse me, small amounts of those allergens and seeing what happens. So for example, if it's done on the back, they'll be done very specifically, different allergens put in different places, and they'll look and see if the area gets hot, swollen, inflamed, um, all signs of an immune reaction against that food. Now again, you can get a blood test done that will look for these allergic reactions. But here's a really important point to understand. There are many different ways that the immune system can react to foods. So an allergy test, your classic allergy test, here we're talking about the allergy that MDs are talking about, not necessarily food allergies that you might hear other alternative or integrative practitioners talking about. The allergies that MDs are talking about are done through an antibody, a type of antibody known as IgE. Now these allergies tend to cause your typical allergic symptoms. They'll cause rashes or hives on the skin. They can cause um, runny eyes, runny nose. They can cause swelling of the face. They can cause swelling of the lips. In extreme cases, they can cause swelling of the throat. Um, and this is where we see those really tragic cases of, like for example, peanut allergies that, are, that we're seeing so much more of now. These are your typical IgE reactions. And the testing for it can be very helpful. Having said that, for many people, they already know that certain foods cause reactions. They eat apples, for example, and their lips and tongue tingle. That's not supposed to happen. That's a sign, uh, a very mild, a milder sign of these type of reactions. So while these can be incredibly helpful for people, a lot of people that we see these type of tests don't really shed much light or, or are very useful for many people. Now, it's important to know that there are other ways the immune system can react other than just this classic allergy IgE type reactions. Now, the two other antibodies that we want to discuss are known as IgG, not IgE, but IgG and IgG. A. And when alternative or integrative providers often use the word food allergy, uh, we like to call it food sensitivity so that doesn't get mixed up. Because again, allergy to MDs means IgE. That's the only type of allergy they recognize. But we're talking about other ways the immune system can react. So IgG and IgA antibodies. Now, there are blood tests. These are the type of tests that you're often seeing when we talk about food sensitivity panels. There are many different companies that offer these. There are many different like tweaks and different ways and things uh, that these tests are done. And it's not uh, we're not going to get into a debate about all the different companies and all the different ways. Of course, each company wants to point out that they have the best way or their technique works better. And there definitely seem to, seem to be some better and worse practices that are going on for people. Um, but we're not going to get into all the different ways as that would take uh, forever, basically. Okay, so IgG is the most common type of food sensitivity testing um, that is done out there. Now, it's important to recognize that there are real debates that are going on here. Most MDs would say that it is possible to have these IgG antibodies against food, and that would be completely normal and not any issue. So this we'll get into, and we'll talk about this more in depth next week, that 
for any of these type of reactions. In fact, as long as they're not severe, even IgE, it's important to validate that these are actually real and problematic issues. So especially with IgG, IgA type reactions, that's where the elimination and challenge diet comes in and that's what we're gonna talk about all next week. It is a critically important component because we have to say, Actually, let me pause for one second. I'll come back to that in a moment. So there is debate. Many MDs consider these tests to be invalid and that IgG style reactions can be completely normal and aren't a sign of an actual negative reaction going on there. Uh, we often find in the integrative and alternative community that we definitely see these reactions are problematic for people. And when people take these foods out um, as part of a comprehensive healing protocol, they find significant improvement in, in bothersome symptoms and troubles that are going on for people, okay? Um, the second piece is, um, this is a personal pet peeve of mine, I find many practitioners are only doing the Ig. G style reactions. When I do these tests, and we'll talk about that in a minute, I always run both IgG. Now, IgG is an antibody that circulates primarily in the bloodstream, can tend to cause problems anywhere in the body because it is systemic and in the blood. IgA is more in the cavities of the body. So specifically in the digestive tract, in the lungs, they can be in the vagina and other cavities of the body. And so, again, this isn't always cut and dry, but if your symptoms are primarily kind of lung-based, maybe more phlegm and asthma, or specifically gut-based in the type of work that we deal with, um, we've often seen that we can see reactions against Ig. A, but not necessarily against IgG. So when I run these tests, I always run the combined IgG, IgA panels. Now IgE, like we mentioned before, classic allergy can be useful, but again, many of the patients that I see, it's pretty obvious to them if they have those style reactions, and so we don't often run those tests here in the office. As I mentioned, there are many, many companies out there, um, again, Many nuances, many differences, all of them will claim to be the best. Many of them are quite useful. It's important to recognize that with these food sensitivity tests, you only find what you test for. So the most common ones run around 90 foods. There are some of the more comprehensive that go into several hundred foods. There are some slimmer tests that may only look at 20 or 30 different foods, look at the more common issues. It's important to recognize that you can only find what you actually look for. So if you run 20 foods and you don't have any problem with those, all that tells you is you don't have any problem with those 20 foods. It doesn't say anything about anything else. So it's important if you're concerned about specific foods, is this food actually a problem for me? It's important that the test that you're getting done actually covers that. Now, the next critical piece on these tests is to recognize they are not perfect. Now again, some of them seem to be better than others, but none of them is perfect. All of them can have what are known as false positive. False positive. What that means is something shows up positive or says, yes, you have a problem with that food, but it is false. So we've seen reactions that can occur that show up that the person's like, no, I eat that all the time. I don't have any issues with it. We do elimination challenge diets. Again, we'll cover those next time. They don't see any issues going on with them. So it's important to know that false positives happen. Now on the flip side, there are false negatives. Negative meaning no reaction is shown yet that is incorrect and there are reactions. So this is one of the biggest negatives that I see with these tests is that if we're highly suspicious that certain foods cause problems for a person, they'll do one of these tests and if they don't see an issue, they'll be unwilling to go on to do elimination challenges or to double check and make sure that those foods aren't an issue. So these tests can have false negatives as well where they're saying, no, no, you don't have a problem with that food when you actually do. Now, I don't know the exact statistics, especially across the whole field, 
but generally speaking, we say that these tests are probably somewhere around 80% accurate. So we want you to know that there is the real possibility of both false negatives and false positives when you do these tests, that you can't take them as 100% absolute truth. They need to be interpreted uh, in how what you experience when you actually eat these foods. Now, the la one of the last points around these tests is just to understand the cost. So these tests are typically not covered by insurance. So the IgE testing that we talked about, the classic allergy testing, is almost always covered by insurance. But these IgG, IgA tests are typically rarely covered by insurance. Sometimes there's kind of a co-insurance piece where insurance can be billed for part of it and there's some out of pocket. But these tests are usually gonna feature an out of pocket component. All right, so IgG, IgA, as opposed to IgE, in my two, for my two cents here, and I'll cover a couple more in a moment, making sure that you're getting the combined, if you're gonna do these tests, you're getting the combined IgG, IgA testing done. Many companies with different nuances, all claiming to be the best, there are no perfect tests here. Again, open debate, most MDs are not really going to recognize these um, as valid and useful tests, although as an integrative doctor, I'm here to tell you that they can have significant value um, and they've been very useful for many people over the years. Um, you only find what you test for, so again, make sure if you're concerned about particular foods, double check and make sure that the test that you're doing actually covers those foods or it's not gonna be helpful in that regard. And knowing accuracy, so there are both false negatives and false positives, so you cannot take these tests, especially these food sensitivity tests, but even things like celiac tests, you cannot take them at, as if they are 100% always accurate, always right. It always needs to be double checked um, and to make sure that, that what you're seeing in tests actually reflects what's going on in person. All right, so let's sum this up. My two cents around these food sensitivity tests. So first of all, gut testing can be tremendously useful. It isn't always necessary. So again, if you've seen the video where we talk about reducing the cost of functional medicine, one of the ways um, is to reduce the amount of tests that are done and um, and make educated guesses so the tests aren't always necessary. They can be quite helpful for people, both SIBO tests as well as stool tests. And in future videos, I'll talk more about stool testing. Uh, there are celiac testing, again, we did a video uh, discussing that. If you feel you have celiac disease, in my opinion, it is very important to get celiac testing done because you can have celiac disease and you can have non-gluten uh, non-celiac gluten sensitivity where you don't have celiac but gluten definitely bothers you but for me they're worlds apart one is I eat gluten and I feel bad the other is I eat gluten and it initiates an autoimmune disease which damages and destroys part of my body one is you really should stay away from gluten and if you eat it again you feel bad the other is damage is being done and it's not you you should avoid gluten it's really you must avoid gluten so I I really do recommend if you're really concerned about celiac disease get that test done and get it done properly all right uh, so my two cents here uh, when do I run these tests so uh, uh, in keeping with trying to reduce the cost of functional medicine I often don't run these tests I know many integrative practitioners kind of run them on everyone as a matter of course or they frequently use them I um, mean again if you've had it done you've gotten great results wonderful I often don't run these tests for people next week we'll talk about elimination challenge diets and that's what I tend to recommend more often but these tests do have their use and in general if someone is just totally confused they really don't know what to do they're feeling overwhelmed they're really uncertain um, what's going on then we'll recommend doing these tests the second would be if they really want to do these tests then we'll do these tests the third would be if they've done elimination challenge diets and things are still really unclear for someone again they just don't know where what to do or where to go um, these tests can be quite helpful otherwise I do tend to recommend the elimination challenge diets and the last piece would be to run these tests if someone truly won't make changes without seeing a test 
in front of them. So there's some people out there, and you may be one of them, that really needs to see test results to make significant changes. And then these tests can be quite helpful. Although again, we talk about false positives and especially false negatives in that case. Tests are not perfect and there can be issues that are going on for people. All right, folks, we're coming up on 20 minutes here. So let's bring today's video to a close. Next week, we're going to talk about the elimination diet, which is a critical component of finding out how foods are affecting us. All right, folks, at Aspire Natural Health, we are experts at treating gut problems, autoimmune diseases, and other hard-to-treat cases. If that's you or someone you love, we can help. Reach out to us. We offer a free 10-15 to 15 minute phone consultation where we can find out if we can help you and if we'd be a good fit for you. So please feel welcome. Reach out to us. We'd be happy to help. All right, folks, next week we'll come back, talk about the elimination diet. And as always, if you have any questions or concerns, you can reach out, post a comment, uh, send us a message, drop us an email, or send us a phone call. Uh, we'd be happy to take those questions in for future, uh, future talks here to, to help answer questions. All right, folks, until next time, take care.